Hey guys, I hope you're having a nice evening. Today we are going to be talking about the history of cell discovery and also cell structures and their functions. So please be filling in your notes organizer as I go through the video. If you've lost it, you can always print it off from the blog. So question one on your notes organizer is what is a cell? Um, the basic definition of cell is that cells are the smallest unit of life that is classified as a living thing. Or you could say that a cell is the basic structural um, unit of all living organisms. The basic unit of life. Cells are often also known as the building blocks of life. Every living thing is made up of one or more cells. So how do we know what we know today about cells? Well, it really started with a guy named Robert Hooke in 1665, and he was the first one to sort of build a simple microscope and view a piece of cork underneath the microscope, which is actually dead plant cells. So he noticed that when he, this is actually his illustration from his notebook here, and what he noticed is that when he looked at the cork underneath the microscope, it looked like little small rooms. So he gave them the term celluli, which actually means small rooms. He thought they looked like the small rooms that um, monks lived in at the time. So he was really the first person to coin the term cell that we use today to describe these basic structures. And then in 1683, you had Anton von Leeuwenhoek, who was the first scientist to really view a living organism underneath a microscope. He took pond water and put it under the microscope, and he saw little animal-like organisms that he called animalcules, which like molecules but animals, animalcules, but we call them today protozoans, which are animal-like protists. So he probably saw amoebas, he probably saw plant-like protists, algae, um, but that was Anton von Leeuwenhoek. So you should be filling in number three on your notes organizer. Then you had two scientists that really contributed to our, our understanding of the cell theory, and that was Schleiden and Schwann. And Schleiden, he studied a whole bunch of different types of plants and noticed that all plants are made up of cells. No matter what type of plant he looked at underneath the microscope, he noticed that they consisted of cells. And here you can see some plant cells, probably something similar to what he saw. And then a year later, um, Theodore Schwann, he studied a whole bunch of different animal tissues and noticed that all of them were made up of cells. So he came to the conclusion that all animals consist of cells. The way I always remember what these two scientists did is um, Schwann sounds like swan, right? Which is an animal. So Schwann studied animals and then Schleiden studied plants. And they actually were friends and basically over tea one day they were discussing their work and, and realized that, hmm, you study plants and they're all made of cells. I study animals and they're all made of cells. So together their work really allowed us to develop the cell theory which says these three things. All living things are composed of one or more cells. Cells are the basic unit of structure of all living things. And cells come from pre-existing cells, which pass on that genetic information from one generation to the next. In other words, cells don't just spontaneously generate from nowhere. So here's the cell theory. These are the, oh, I guess I should be using my highlighter instead. These are the three statements of the cell theory. This is number four on your notes organizer. So all living things are made up of cells. Cells are the basic unit of life. And cells come from other cells. Okay, there are two cell types, and students get confused between these two cell types and which organisms are which, but it's very, very simple. Prokaryotes, pro, no, no what, no nucleus. So prokaryotes lack a nucleus and other membrane-bound organelles. They do not have a nucleus. So in other words, their genetic material is just sort of free-floating um, within the cell. It's not bound within a nucleus. And then it doesn't have any of those other fancy organelles that you've probably heard of before. Mitochondria, chloroplast, endoplasmic reticulum. It doesn't have any of those. All it's got is the genetic materials, some ribosomes, and the cytoplasm. And that's pretty much it. There is only one type of organism that have pro prokaryotic cells, and that is bacteria. The only type of organism that is prokaryotic is bacteria. So that is number six on your notes organizer. Eukaryotes are everything else. So protists, fungi, plants, and animals are all eukaryotes. And remember, you, you are an animal, so you are eukaryotic. Eukaryote, you. Pro, no. So eukaryotes, their cells do have a nucleus and those other fancy organelles that you probably learned about in life science in seventh grade, mitochondria, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi body, all of that stuff. 
Okay, but the key here is the nucleus. So prokaryotes, bacteria, no nucleus. Eukaryotes, you, animals, plants, fungi, protists, have a nucleus. Okay, so that is number seven on your notes organizer. So where did these eukaryotic cells come from? Well, in the 1980s, we had the development of the endosymbiotic theory, which explains the origin of eukaryotic cells. It explains how we have these cells that have different parts to them, the nucleus, the mitochondria, the chloroplast. And basically, it says that, you know, billions of years ago, you had prokaryotes, and that was pretty much it. You had big prokaryotes and little prokaryotes, so big bacteria and little bacteria, and maybe one day, one of those big bacteria or big prokaryotes engulfed, like went to have for lunch, a smaller prokaryote. And that smaller prokaryote that was engulfed, instead of getting digested up, just sort of started living symbiotically, like in a really close relationship with that larger bacteria. And they sort of lived together as one. And then when, when the cell went to divide, when that big prokaryote went to divide, it actually divided the smaller one as well. So it sort of started living and reproducing as a single organism. So the smaller prokaryotes were engulfed by the larger prokaryotes. They lived in a symbiotic relationship, and then they started dividing as one. And there's a lot of evidence to support this theory, but the biggest being that um, organelles like the mitochondria and the chloroplast actually have DNA that's separate from the DNA found in the nucleus. So that sort of supports the idea that at one time they were two separate organisms. So that is the endosymbiotic theory number eight on your notes organizer. Explains the origin of eukaryotic cells. Tells us where eukaryotic cells came from. So we talked about the different cell types. You should know these terms by now, unicellular and multicellular. Unicellular, of course, being an organism made up of only one cell, a single cell. Um, all of your bacteria are unicellular. Some of your protists are unicellular, and then some of your fungi, like yeast, are unicellular. All other organisms are multicellular. They consist of more than one cell. Um, so are multicellular organisms made up of prokaryotic or eukaryotic cells? So here we would be talking about some of our protists, most of our fungi, all of our plants, and all of our animals. Are they made up of prokaryotic or eukaryotic cells? Eukaryotic cells, right? Because the only thing that's prokaryotic is bacteria. And all bacteria are unicellular. All bacteria are unicellular. So our multicellular organisms are going to be eukaryotic cells. So prokaryotic cells, eukaryotic cells, plant cells, animal cells, bacteria cells, they all have structures that differ from one organism to another. Um, so, for example, plant cells have different structures than, than animal cells do. A lot of them are the same, but there are some defining characteristics. So that's what we're going to talk about here. So here are the defining characteristics of a bacteria cell. Now, every cell has a cell membrane. Okay, That would be like this little green layer here in this picture. Um, but bacteria cells and plant cells, for example, have cell walls as their outer layer. So they have an outer cell wall layer. They're, of course, prokaryotic. They do not have a nucleus. They do not have membrane-bound organelles. And their DNA is free-floating. So those are the characteristics of a bacteria cell. And of course, let's review. Are bacteria prokaryotic or eukaryotic? You should know this by now. They are prokaryotic, the only one. Everything else is eukaryotic. So here are defining characteristics of plant cells. Again, we have that outer um, layer, cell wall layer. We still have a cell membrane inside the cell wall, but the outer layer is the cell wall. They also have structures called chloroplasts. You've probably heard that term before. This is the site of photosynthesis, where photosynthesis takes place, so of course we're going to have them in plants. And then they have this large central vacuole, and that's this big old blue bubbly looking structure here. And what do you think that is full of in a plant cell? Water. There's the nucleus, then you have your vacuole full of water. Okay, and then, of course, this is a eukaryotic cell. And then our last major cell type are animal cells. These do not have cell walls. They have cell membranes as their outer layer. And then they also have these really cool organelles. So these are our cells. Our cells have these cool organelles called lysosomes, um, which are digestive organelles. They contain enzymes that break like waste down and things like that. So those are the defining characteristics of an animal cell.
Now let's quiz, are animal cells prokaryotic or eukaryotic? You're an animal, right? Your cells are eukaryotic. The only thing that's prokaryotic are bacteria. Okay, number 12 on your notes organizer. What is an organelle? So I've used this term a lot so far in the video, organelle, but let's take a pause and think about like what that actually is. There are those little structures found within the cell, right? All these little numbered things are organelles. Um, what they are, they are differentiated structures within a cell which perform specific functions. So they're structures that have specific jobs. And now we're going to talk about our examples of organelles um, that you are going to be responsible for knowing. I'm going to go through these pretty fast, but if I go too fast, you can always pause the video or go back to any slide you need me to, to return to. So of course our big, one, our big organelle here that we're going to find in eukaryotic cells is going to be the nucleus. This is the brain of the cell. It controls all cell activities. This is found in animal and plant cells, not in bacteria cells, so only in eukaryotic cells. Um, our nucleus holds the genetic information, so DNA is going to be found within our nucleus. That's the first organelle on your chart. Okay, next up we have the cell membrane. This is our bouncer of the cell, you know, like a bouncer from like a, a club or something like that. They control what goes in and out of the building. Our cell membrane controls what goes in and out of the cell. They have a very, very important job to do. Make sure wastes are going out and good things are coming in, right? They are a cell membrane is semi-permeable, which means it doesn't let just anything in and out. It only lets some things. It's permeable only to certain items. So the cell membrane is a semi-permeable double layer that surrounds the cell, controls what goes in and out, that's its function, and it is found in every cell type, so bacteria, animal, and plants. The cell wall we've talked a little bit about, um, of course, we mostly talk about it in terms of plant cells. In plant cells, the cell wall is cellulose. It provides plants and other organisms with protection and structure, so there is its function. Um, plants also do have cell membranes, so plants have cell membranes, but the outer layer is the cell walls. So in what type of cell are we going to find cell walls, bacteria, and plant cells? Okay, next up we have chloroplasts. These are full of that green stuff called chlorophyll, and that is where photosynthesis happens. So the function of the chloroplast is the site of photosynthesis. And then make sure you write this down, please. Here's the overall process of photosynthesis. We use energy from the sun, and we use it to make food for the plant. That is the big picture that you need to understand about what is happening inside the chloroplast during photosynthesis. Energy from the sun used to make food for the plant. That's glucose, sugars. The cytoskeleton, just like it sounds, is a network of microtubules that support and give structure to the cell. So here are our microtubules right here, part of our cytoskeleton. The endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum is known as the cell highway because it's used for transportation. It carries proteins and other materials from one part of the cell to another. This can be smooth or it can be rough depending on whether, it ha whether or not it has ribosomes attached. So if it does have ribosomes, we call it the rough ER. If it doesn't have ribosomes, it's the smooth ER. The Golgi apparatus or Golgi body is a multi-layered organelle used for packaging and transportation. Anytime you see that word packaging, it's talking about the Golgi apparatus. So this is our post office. And that is found in plant and animal cells. Okay, lysosomes, these are our digestive structures. So they're used to break down worn parts and waste products in the cell. They are found only in animal cells. These are our garbage truck. The mitochondria, this is the powerhouse of the cell because they produce energy during the process of cellular respiration. And cell respiration is basically the opposite of photosynthesis. We break down food and we use it to get energy, remember? Photosynthesis was using energy to make food. Cell respiration in the mitochondria is taking food and bringing it down to... Ribosomes are these tiny little organelles found in every type of cell because they are used to produce proteins. Some of them are floating in the cytoplasm, others are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. The vacuole is that organelle that's used for storage, like in plants it's used to store water. Um, when the vacuole is empty, that's when your plant looks all wilted and very sad looking. Cytoplasm, 
gel-like substance found in cells fills in all that empty space.